HBCU Digest Radio, welcome back. I'm your host, Jared Carter. We are certainly honored and privileged to have with us this afternoon uh, the distinguished uh, athletic director at Dillard University and now the interim commissioner of the NAIA, uh, Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes, um, who is a legend in, in so many ways. Um, <laughs> oh, God. No, she is. She is, regardless of what she says, to talk over me. Um, but I, I mean, a sister who has from the coaching ranks to the administrative ranks uh, to conference to now league um, has just ran the show. And Dr. Barnes, first, thank you for the time. Um, you're actually at the NAIA conference right now, right? Yes, and we're actually in day two of the convention. So uh, we're having a good time getting a chance to see some of my good friends. And now everybody's calling me Kamish. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so what, what, is, what is that like? Because <laughs> I, I know it sounds it sounds like, oh, man, I can't believe this is happening. But you you've basically ran Dillard so well. You've been the president, first African-American sister to to run the, the, the Gulf Coast Athletic Conference. I mean, you've had stuff like this before. Does it feel different from the other things that you've been able to do? Absolutely. It, it doesn't. It doesn't feel different at all. Uh, when we were transitioning, when I was president and we were transitioning from uh, Dr. Howell, who was the first commissioner for the GCAC, and Steve, our, our previous commissioner that was a full semester where i actually ran the conference during that time i mean there wasn't a press release or you know i wasn't appointed the title but um i actually did the work during that time to kind of keep things afloat while we were trying to determine what our next steps would be and what direction we wanted to see the conference go so i guess the difference is this time it's i have an actual title <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a title this time, and people think it's pretty cool. So, um, I mean, we're just, I mean, we've got a conference track meet coming up next week. So, I've kind of just hit the ball rolling, just trying to make sure we get all the things we need to take care of to have a, you know, a good meet. Um, and then once we get through our conference track meet, we'll get a chance to start talking about what are the next steps for the conference and what direction do we want to go. So, the, the, the Gulf Coast Conference or Athletic Conference, GCAC, let me be, let me be very specific, GCAC is yeah. is like one of the jewels of the NAIA, right? Like you guys and and part of it is because of Dillard and Xavier's success obviously. Um but because there are a number of teams that 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 compete well, um uh, particularly in men's and women's basketball, do you find Absolutely. that that there with this new position that there is much you have to work with your your you know your peer ADs and and other folks to do or do you just say, "Hey, we're running a tight ship now. Let's let's see if we can build upon that." Well, I mean, I think that's what we have to do. I think we have to come together. I think we have to talk about what it looks like uh, for us moving forward. So one of the things that's happening at our level is with basketball. You mentioned basketball because we have done really, really well. This year, mm -hmm. Tougaloo won the conference uh, championship on the men's side mm -hmm. and actually got a number one seed. I'm not sure if we've ever had a team from the GCAC actually get the number one seed for um, for one of the four areas. So mm -hmm. This year we had Tougaloo get the number one seed um, and go to the national tournament. It's like, oh, my gosh. You know, they, I think they finished – they were fourth in the country at that time. So, I mean, one of the top four teams out of GCAC. Well, I think we have to think about how we continue to expand on – our, our basketball championships, um, because, again, we've done well. And this year, I mean, Dillard had it. We had a down year this year. We lost a couple of kids to injuries and some things like that. But Xavier has consistently competed well in basketball. Um, Talladega has cons has consistently done well in, in, in uh, basketball. And now, even with Everwater, they're, they had a good year this year. They wound up upsetting us in the first round, but they've had – uh, a good year. The coach down there, I think he's going to do a really good job uh, with helping get that program back. And they've got a new president who's who's really supportive of athletics, and I'm pretty sure he's going to ensure that they have the resources that they need to compete. Mm -hmm. So I think where we are with the NAI, again, we've had we usually have at least three teams that can make it to the national tournament. Mm -hmm. Now, what we have happening is we're going to be moving from 
one division in basketball, I mean, two divisions in basketball to one division. And our champion, our national championship structure is going to change. So uh, we'll have to kind of figure out what that's going to look like uh, for us. We may have to be looking into expanding teams so we can ensure we can get two teams in, you know, via the automatic qualification system. Mm-hmm. Um, those are some of the things that are coming forward that we'll have to figure out um so i don't know it's going to be real interesting i'm looking forward to having a conversation and uh working with my colleagues to figure out how we take this thing to the next level now apart from running the gcac you're actually going to keep your 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 day job at diller talk a little bit <laughs> <I> would... <laughs> <laughs> talk a little bit about yeah. If looking backward just a little bit and i know that's going to be stressful but again it's one of those things like you put so much work in at du you got men's and women's sports coming along very nicely and competitive competitive for the conference t- t- title all the time what was the what was your strategy as outside of obviously hiring great coaches and trying to get talented students in to play and play for and have good long careers what were some of the other things that you did that people the average fan may not know that it takes to build a sound program on on men's and women's side of the ball Wow. Well, you want me to tell you what? I'll, I'll tell you this. One of the things that I was uh, that I feel like I wasn't prepared for initially when I took the job as athletic director and head women's basketball coach was the amount of time that I was going to need to to spend coaching coaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know you you have to. At a, at, a, at a school like at an HBCU, and let me just be honest, you know, our resources are different, yeah. you know, from yeah. some of the larger schools, you know. You, you, you're not going to necessarily get the, the top, top, top coach because the top, top coach costs a lot of money. Right. Um, but you may have someone who's got a lot of potential, but they're not there yet. Mm-hmm. And they need, if they, if they have the proper support, you know, then they can become a championship level coach and can win some program, you know, win some games, you know, develop a program into a national championship. And then, you know, it could uh, springboard them to another larger opportunity. And that's one of the things that I, I wasn't really prepared for. I was like, yeah, we graduated. We, you know, people have graduated. They have a degree. You know, I should be able to get someone here and then they're just going to do their job. And I, it wasn't that way. <laughs> I had to provide way more support that I was initially prepared to. And I remember resisting that at first because I was like, well, you know, we all have a degree. Y'all should you know, know what y'all you doing. Should, <laughs> you, should, you should know. Like, why do I need to tell you this? Right, you know, right. I, I felt like it was improper for me as the leader at that time to be telling them things that I felt like they should know. Mm-hmm. And so it took me the first three years to get past the fact that, well, maybe they don't know. So it's your responsibility as their leader. If, you, if you've if you committed to them, then you got to commit to their success and doing everything you can as their athletic director to put them in position to win. That's everything from making sure they have scholarships, making sure the equipment budget is is. It's comparable. I mean, you know, we're not flying in places, mm-hmm. you know, and you're not going to get two warm-ups, but we're going to make sure you get one warm-up. We're going to make sure you have, <laughs> you know, and a couple of T-shirts, right. you know, you're going to get a travel bag. Right. You know, to me, those were things that were standard. And so my thing is I'm going to ask for my coach to give – me everything that they have so my job as athletic directors to make sure that they have everything they need to be critical to watch them to share my my thoughts from the outside and to provide any kind of information that will help them blossom and help them be successful and so i think it's i don't know if it's something that people really spend a lot of time talking about but i feel like as an athletic director here i develop into a coach's coach Mm. Uh, and so yeah go ahead i was gonna say so it's funny that you say that because i don't get the impression across all sports not just hbcu sports that people really know what an an ad does but yet in in a lot of in a lot of conferences black white and otherwise when things aren't going well on the field on the court they say fire the ad so Mm. and that doesn't happen with you especially they better not happen with you because they know y'all winning but that's right how is it what do you think that that people should know about what an ad does 
that would reflect in the wins and loss column that would reflect in, you know, obviously beyond students graduating, coaches being there for a long time and having a good relationship. Are there things that fans should know? This is what an AD does in, in that this is how it turns into something on the field, on the court. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I, I think, you know, I, the, the coaching management piece is one, but the, the ADs having the support that they need to provide the support for the coaches. So ADs are responsible for trying to do fundraising. They're also responsible for meeting all the regulations of whatever association you're a member of. We're a member of the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, the NAI. Mm -hmm. You have some schools who are a member of the NCAA. Well, those athletic directors are responsible for ensuring that those programs are compliant with whatever the association rules are. Um, there is a requirement that the that the athletic director. I mean, now we're doing Title IX training. We are the the priority person for it. it so, if an athlete is involved in a situation with Title IX, a sexual assault, we're the person responsible for reporting and getting that information to whatever the appropriate party is on campus to ensure that we're meeting the federal guidelines for these kinds of things. Um, good Lord. I mean, there's a myriad mm -hmm. of things, things an athletic director uh, is doing uh, to try to ensure that programs are compliant uh, as well as competitive. And so uh, sometimes they think we just kind of show up at games and, you know, sit up there and, you know, we, we look important. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> depending on the school you at, I mean, you could be doing game day management work. I, I mean, wow. I set up and break down at my game. Wow. Um, now, I have a group of students, and I, I, I have some people who help me. But, hey, I mean, I can do everything from put chairs down and pick up, sweep a floor, uh, to sit in the president's uh, office on the on a, a important call, you know, that's regarding uh, the program. So there's a lot that goes into being an athletic director when there are complaints about coaches. Uh, the athletic director is the person that's hearing those complaints. Um, ensuring that the student athlete has a good experience. What does that look like? Uh, their, the facilities that they practice in, the times that they practice. Um, you know, what kind of support they're getting academically, whether they're getting tutors, whether the support systems are in place to ensure that the students have academic success. That's a part of the athletic director's uh, responsibility. So, um, yeah, it's a, it, it can be a lot. And and this is all without being at a, at a football school. I mean, it's oh, yeah. it, it's a big deal without football. So, I mean, did you imagine? Yeah. You know, obviously your career is in coaching. You've been the Under Armour AD of the year. You've been a two-time AD of the year in, in, the, in the Gulf Coast. I mean, you've been lauded by the NAIA a number of times, sat on dozens of committees. Um, do you ever feel like it? there's still a lot to do, even though I've proven a lot, and that that it's okay for you? Like there's there's not there's not yet another challenge to go exceed. Is it is it just turning into turning Dillard into the perfect version of itself athletically? Well, I think we always have to evolve. Like, I don't think you ever reach that point. Does that make any sense? Right. Um, at the end of the year, we can win everything, and I'm still like we could have been better, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because because what, I, what I've learned is once you ascend it to some level of success, Number one, you want to be able to replicate that success. But number two, everybody want to have a success you got. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what? We force people to step up their game. Like I make jokes about it all the time. I was like, I'm going to make somebody work. I was like, we don't continue to win until you beat us, so step up. Get out and recruit. Right. Go do some work. Right. Like, and that's that's the coaching uh, athlete coming out in. That's right. That's but right. what I'm not gonna do, what I'm not gonna do, is take a break and tell my coaches, "Oh, well, we've won the last three years, so you know what? We don't have to do anything else now because we have arrived. Mm -hmm. You you never arrive. You have to evolve. So it's always at the end of the year, what could we have done better? What what goals did we actually meet? Um, and then. What, a, what what will take us to another level? What hasn't been done that we can set the pace for? And um, so for me, I mean, yeah, I have a good time because there's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. What do you what do you, what are your opinions on? I don't want to say emergence because women's sports has always been a big deal. I'm a huge women's basketball, college basketball fan and WNBA fan. Um, mm -hmm. 
what is your opinion of the, the growing popularity of sisters in sports and particularly at HBCUs where you see um, we're starting to win a few games in the postseason, even in the NCAA in, in Division mm-hmm. One. You see us competing in the, the CIT and the NIT. Um, you know, we've always been competitive in the NAIA. Uh, but what what is it what is it like for you as a coach and an athlete to see? Okay, we're starting to these these programs, particularly among the women, are starting to do things and, and compete for national titles. We've seen Shaw in the last ten years win a national mm-hmm. Division Two title. You know, we've seen him go to the mm-hmm. final Virginia Union go to the Final Four. What is it? Wh- the women are moving ahead faster than the men in terms of national competition for titles. How? What? What do you think has created that that opportunity for the sisters, and how can we expand upon that? Ah, you know that's a that's an interesting question. I when you when you look at women's basketball, and I I think versus men's basketball, I don't think women are as caught up in NCAA Division One, Division Two, and level. Mm-hmm. So you're you're talking about. Uh, Shaw, Shaw and uh, the yeah. Junior Union, those are NCAA D2 schools. Mm-hmm. You know, you and a, and a Dillard. Like, we have kids, we've recruited students who were Division One talent, mm-hmm. but they weren't concerned about Division One. They were concerned about student experience. They wanted to enjoy college. Mm-hmm. They wanted to play basketball, compete for national championships, and have a good time. They wanted to play as a fraternity or sorority or, I mean, or sorority for the girls. I mean, so it, it was like, I want, I want to feel like family. Like I want to feel like more than just a student. And so I think that what you see from, from women is a more willingness, a, a willingness to pursue a program that's successful, um, whether regardless of division, and where they can also have a life. Mm-hmm. So I think you see that on the women's side. On the men's side, it's a lot different. Guys are like, I'm D1, I'm D1, I'm D1. I'm not talking to a Dillard or a baby. I'm not talking to you because I'm D1. I'm going to the pro. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, I think that on the men's side, young men are more limited, and they're not as open to small college basketball is that you know yeah. that's who we are in mm-hmm. AI small college basketball or NCAA division two small college basketball it, you know it's not D1 uh, even though all D1 isn't created equal because mm-hmm. <laughs> LSU and University of New Orleans are two different are two different schools but they're both D1 you know so I just think that on the men's side they just you know, they're still like, I'm, I'm trying to go pro and I want to be D1. So they would skip over a, a top 25 program like a Dillard University mm-hmm. or a Talladega or a, a Tougaloo because they're looking for that D1 offer. Um, and so some of those programs, you know, it makes it harder for the guys, I think, to advance. Um, I don't know. But we've been fortunate. I will say that I have an outstanding men's basketball coach who is a very good recruiter. He's been in the game for, I think, 30 years. Jesus, he's been in the game for a long time. <laughs> and so he, he has kids. I love Coach. Coach got kids. That he, he's coaching the kids of kids he coached when he was in his young year. That's, mm. that's where he is in life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he, he's had two kids come through, and his, his, their dads played for him. Wow. So I don't know. That, that's my thought. I just, you know, I think you can, I think, you know, it, the, with women, you can just, we're just a little bit more open to all of the other opportunities and not just, I got to wait, you know, until the D1 offer, then I don't have one, and now I'm just going to settle, and then that's sour about it. You know, I don't know. What does, that's just my thought. What, now that you're, you're running the show for the, for the conference, and mm-hmm. you've been running the show with Dillard, and you've seen – NCAA, NAIA, you've coached, I mean, you've played, you, you've seen all elements mm-hmm. of, of what college athletics looks like. What does the, mm-hmm. what is the perfect version of what we could do? And I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, GCAC or, or you know, MEAC or SWAC or CIAA or anything like that. When, if, mm-hmm. we are, if we are doing all that we could do, what do we look like in terms of fan engagement, in terms of talent acquisition, in terms of revenue 
and, and and what does it look like and what's the one big thing that you think that our schools could do to move towards that perfect version of what we could be oh boy jesus that's a loaded question <laughs> <laughs> i mean you seen it all it ain't my fault <laughs> it ain't my fault you look, good <laughs> look let, let me ask you this are we talking specifically hbcu hbcu right yes, now ma'am. Yes, ma'am. HBCUs. Oh boy! Because as, no, as you as, as you said, we we have resource challenges. So obviously, the answer is we get more money, and if we get more money, yep. we enhance the game day experience. We have more yep. opportunity to recruit from a wider pool. Um, you know, yep. we can hire better coaches, and you know, we can have right. more media opportunities. That that's what happens right. with more money. But until we get to the to the day where we have quote unquote more money. Is there something yeah. that we could do as a as you know either a Dillard community or a GCAC yeah. community or an HBCU community that pushes us one step closer to where we want to be until we get those resources? What's one thing that you look yeah. at from all your experience that you say this this could change things if we do it this way? Well, you know what I mean. My my one thing is we got to stop com- we got to stop comparing ourselves to the other institutions and we have to define what is good for us and then we have to stand in that so one of the conversations i this is one of the conversations we had before i even became commissioner with uh the gcac about our basketball tournament i wanted to host the tournament at dillard Mm -hmm. but they're like no we want to be at xavier's campus because Xavier has the most beautiful facility uh if you ask me in the country they've got like a four thousand seater um, I mean, arena style seating. I mean, it's fancy. And theirs is, rel- mean, theirs the is relatively new, though, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. They this this was built right after Katrina. Right. So I mean, but it's a beautiful facility. And I mean, our facility is it's it's more it's it's a twelve hundred seater. I mean, we can see twelve hundred people. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I told them, what what I said is, we have to use the mentality that they use in Miami. Mm-hmm. So I went to Miami on a girls' trip, uh, maybe about five years ago. So we're there's this long line. We're headed out. We're going to a club, and I'm talking about the line is around the corner. Mm-hmm. So we're like, oh man, this is this this place is going to be jumping. Mm-hmm. So everybody's in line. They're standing outside. They're waiting. We finally get into the club. Ain't nobody in the club. <laughs> So what did they walk away from the door when they got up there? <laughs> but now, now, by the time the night was over, it was jumping. Uh-huh. But what they did was they created the hot ticket. Uh-huh. They created the hot ticket. They they let the they they had a long line for a reason because they said if they see people trying to get in, mm-hmm. they know they'll number one be able to charge top dollars mm-hmm. because it looks like I might not be able to get in. So I want to get in because I might not be able to get in. Mm-hmm. And so my thing was when I shared that with them, I said we got to create the hot ticket. We need to go to a smaller venue. We need to pack it out, make it exclusive. and tell people they can't yeah. get in. Uh-huh. I said at that point. Now we can raise the price because people will pay now because they know they can't get in. You create scarcity. Yeah. So instead of trying to go to Xavier, where and I, this is things I've said to them, so it's you know it's not anything I, that they haven't heard from me. Instead of going to a four thousand seater, let's get this thing to a twelve hundred seater. Let's pack it out. We got live stream. They gonna see it's lit. That's what the kids say. It's gonna be turned. We got the DJ. I mean, it's it's like oh man, you should have been there. Everybody gonna be talking about what they missed out. Yeah. Now when we come back for the next year for the tournament, everybody's buying tickets early. Because now we created a product that they want to pay for. And everybody ain't going to get in. <laughs> but what we try to do is, oh, LSU got a, a 20,000 seater. Oh, we, 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 we'll, we'll go to a bigger facility to try to compete with them. We're never going to compete with them. Why are we even comparing ourselves to them? We do two different things. It's why, and it's why I will tell you the one thing that I like the most. Uh, celebration bowl. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad we have our own bowl. Yeah, I'm so happy about that because when you look at the classics, like we've done it in football, like Bayou Classic, like attendance records for SWAC schools for football are higher than any of the other people in the FCS. That's right. Because we have a model that works. Yeah. For our and people. we stick with yes. Yeah. So why are we always comparing ourselves to and like it's it's just you're gonna lose every time. Like I was like that makes no sense. 
And so what I said to my colleagues was, we are small college basketball. Embrace that mm. and make people feel it. I was like, have you, you, have to, you have to come to the Blue Devil Classic. Our game versus Dylan versus Xavier, it is the Bayou Classic of basketball. That's right. That's right. We sell out of tickets every year, yeah. and we sell every ticket. But because that, but, we create, but that's a rivalry cre- though. It's like so you you can do that with Xavier because that's literally a crosstown rivalry. Do you think that that would work can, for the conference tournament? Yes, mm-hmm. it absolutely would if we create the atmosphere and if we can if we can we have to we have to do the similar the kind of the same thing around the celebration bowl like the same kind of deal like you got to build it up like you got to be there you got to support your team we crown the champion like. Mm-hmm. And people have to be willing to pay for that ticket. And so I think we can do it, but we have to stop trying to be other people. We have to be true to who we are. Why do we need to be in a bigger venue? We don't need to be in a bigger venue. We need to pack it out. We need to have the DJ and we need people wanting to get in, bring the entertainment in. And, and we need to, and we need to own that.